So Jared Yates, we have been here at Falcon Space Labs for the better part of a week and we will be here for a few days more. We'll run through a ton of experiments. Jared, what are we looking at? All right, so Michael Perone, another member of our team, he created a really interesting low friction uh, carousel that we were using to try to test uh, some of Dr. Charles Bueller and Drew Arigula's, uh, Arigma, uh their electric thruster. So here you can see the, the parallel plate capacitors that he's got in here with the dielectric capped on tape. And then we have this ring sits inside this little channel that is currently filled with galistan, which is a liquid metal, a metal of liquid, a liquid metal at room temperature. And this thing just sets right down inside there and swings right around, spins around, and we're able to apply a high voltage to these plates while simultaneously getting very low friction, which is ideal for most of these very low impulse thrust uh, tests we're doing. So that was a really cool experiment that we ran last night. Unfortunately, our plastic base there had a little bit, uh, not enough, uh, insulation to it so we were getting only up to about 11 kilovolts before it arced across there. Not all that ideal. So the, the liquid metal in this case functions kind of like a bearing but it's conductive, right? Uh, exactly, yeah. So instead of having a metal on metal where you got friction, this is metal on liquid metal and so it's much lower friction as the thing spins around but still maintains electrical contact which you need if you're going to have an electrical circuit like this thing. Yeah, yeah. And then and he's just doing a replication of Bueller's experiment which is you might think of that as variation on Beefield Brown effect. Yes, it, it is not the Beefield Brown effect, but it is a variation on it. Uh, the Drew and Bueller thruster, that thing has probably some of the highest uh, promise for propellantless propulsion that I've seen yet to date, and I've seen a lot. Um, so we really want to help their efforts in any way possible, so we're trying to recreate their stuff to try to help validate what they have already validated a thousand times over, but at least to get a third party to be able to replicate their results, which they've now very generously given the instructions out to the world on how to make your own version of this. It is not easy because you're dealing with such low thrusts, but we're hoping that we're going to be able to iterate on this design and be able to get much higher voltages and much lower friction to be able to actually identify these about one millinewton or less thrusts that he's getting from those. Okay, okay, so what's next on our list? All right, so next on our list, we can come over here, and this is actually what you've been working on, and I've just been helping you. Charles Crawford got a device from someone named Nam Tran. Uh, so the idea is that you have a high voltage uh, electrode attached to this outer ring here and uh, an op polarity high voltage attached to this center core. And by putting this thing up on a carousel, we're able to spin it and that's very high friction right now. The one we have in the chamber is very low friction, but you're able to apply a voltage to this thing and it can spin. And actually just a couple hours ago, we had this thing in the chamber down around uh, 10 to the minus seven tor, and we, you saw it, we got a lot of really good uh, footage of this thing spinning for a good number of minutes at very high vacuum. Um, we're still figuring out exactly what's going on. It might be an ion thruster, it might be a, a new kind of physics, but we're gonna have to do further refinement on that to really identify which of those it is. Uh, the next thing that we worked on is gonna be all the way down at the end, but first let's take a shot right in here so you can actually see that test that I was just talking about. Okay. So inside here you can see we have that same thruster uh, this is the one that was actually built by Nam Tran. That one out there was the one built by Charles Crawford. Uh, and this thing, we have it set up on a magnet so it's very well balanced. And when we had high voltage on this thing, it was spinning pretty fast for a better part of 10 plus minutes before we started seeing it slow down. So uh, it shows some promising results, but we still need to figure out whether or not it's a propellant based or propellantless based. And, Normally it's probably propellant based. We're probably getting some kind of ions out of there, but we don't know for sure yet. So we're, we're following up and we're doing more tests. 
Okay, so this is a metallurgical microscope that you've been using, again, for arts, parts, sample, analysis. This is visual analysis, right? So it is a microscope, but it was designed to work on metals, and I believe you, this has been upgraded by Mark Sokol to like an 18 megapixel camera, which does better pictures. Yes, this uh, is a camera that we just upgraded uh, last week when we were doing some more arts parts analysis on this metallurgical microscope. I discovered some interesting things that I don't think anyone else has noted before on the sample. Uh, we found m ultra microscopic whiskers. These, these little tiny whiskers have a diameter of less than one micron and I can zoom way in here. So the diameter of this thin white line is less than a micron. In a lot of places, they, they blew out in like a star shape, um, which is very indicative that there's been some kind of high voltage applied to the thing at some point. This particular picture I have here happens to have this ball on the end of it, which I thought was uh, quite interesting. Um, we took some control pictures of magnesium orthosilicate because there's a book from the 1960s that talks about uh, the samples retrieved from craft looking like they had lines of magnesium orthosilicate. However, these are about 20 plus microns wide compared to sub one micron. So it's probably not the same stuff that we're seeing here. Those, those little whiskers are probably not magnesium orthosilicate. Um, the other thing I did was I took a lot of videos where I was able to, let's see if I can full screen that for you, where I start zooming in and taking better shots of these whiskers here that are all spewing out in, in that star-shaped pattern. It's, it's a very odd thing. We still need to do further analysis to identify what those whiskers are made of, what their composition of. They're located all over the samples. And the cool thing about this metallurgical microscope is that it has a lot of variability and adjustability so that you can color these things in a lot of different lightings and look for different polarizations of these things. Okay, but I, so I think one of the important things is that, so the arts parts, you know, purported UAP sample has what appears to be microstructures, right? Correct, and these microstructures, we have yet to identify whether those are accidental or purposeful. It's probably prosaic, it, just as, as a, um, from another expert that we had come in and give us their input, they thought that it kind of reminded them of tin whiskers. Now, tin whiskers are a thing that normally happens when certain metals are in a very high voltage gradient environment and you start getting these little ions uh, creating very thin strings or whiskers coming off. Um, however, tin whiskers are much larger than these. So whatever these whiskers are made of, um, it, it allowed it to be ultra small at thicknesses, diameters of one to two microns or less. Uh, and they all are pointing out and originating from the same central structure. So I found probably about a dozen spots all over the sample, the, the bismuth side of the sample, that ends up having these, these particular microstructures on it. And I got another video, last video to share with you. Maybe. And this one is more towards the middle. And these microstructures, very difficult to see when I move the mouse. There you go. So these microstructures, a lot of them seem to happen down in the crevices, down in the cracks, uh, the, the very narrow areas on the business side of the sample. We're gonna do further analysis through the metallurgical microscope eventually, but right now we're focused on getting isotope ratios because we think that'll give us the best bet on where to look for next as to where these craft are getting their materials from. If we can identify the source where the magnesium and the zinc and the business, where those things are being mined from based upon their isotope ratios, that should give us a, a real good smoking gun on uh, places to look for potential other samples. Wonderful. Well, Jared, thank you again so much for walking us through this. Absolutely. My pleasure.